Hello, welcome to Baijus. Today I'm going to tell you a story. Let's say you are a warrior and you are in a war and you come across a castle where the enemy king is hiding. Now you want to ram through the door of that castle. It's a huge bulky door, okay? Now you 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 do everything in your might to break down that door. But what happens is you f- you see that you know uh, when you go around that castle there is actually a, a a hidden a secret path that can lead you inside it so if you could just find that path and that might not exist in all the cases but if you can find that path you'll save a lot of time okay you'll save a lot of effort entering into that castle now we are going to do something like that here okay so we have these questions which are like castles that we want to penetrate that we want to solve and look for a, the enemy king which is the solution that we want to get the quantity that we want to find out but sometimes what happens is these questions have like a secret door okay where you don't actually have to solve the question you don't actually have to break that door but you can enter the problem by an alternate route which most people call trick i don't like to call it trick okay because it's not actually a trick because it doesn't appear out of thin air it's because you have been to many wars you have seen many castles okay you know that some castles have some secret door so when you approach them you know that there can there can be a secret door because you have had a lot of practice with it so only when you practice a lot of problems can sometimes when you see a problem and you feel like okay i don't actually have to solve that i can do it by this alternate method which will be really really quick and that will save me time and which is you know in a war which is not a very bad analogy for je it's not a bad thing right to save time because that's what uh, you're trying to save there and uh, that's what we are going to do we are going to solve some problems today and uh, we are not going to solve them in the usual way what we are going to do is uh, i'm going to show you some problems of je which could have been solved in an alternate way okay in an easier way which would have saved some time so needless to say that uh, while watching this video if you feel that you have genuinely learned something then please do uh, like this video subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so let's start so basically there's a problem where there's something is at rest okay and there's a force which is f not uh, e to the power of minus bt makes sense okay this is uh, okay it's a force which depends on time and we have to find out which of the curves represents the velocity now i can actually go about solving this problem by finding the acceleration the expression for acceleration by dividing this by mass and then finding the expression for velocity by by different by you know by you know by using dv by dt is equal to a so you integrate acceleration and all that thing you can do or i can use a little brain and i think i can think that you know this is a positive quantity right because this is a force in the x direction and this here this expression is never going to be negative so this entire thing is positive that means the acceleration is always going to be positive because it is just this divided by mass so acceleration is always positive it means that acceleration is always in the positive direction the thing starts from rest it means that the velocity is always going to be in the positive direction so velocity would keep increasing and there's no reason for the velocity to decrease there's no reason for the velocity to change its direction so the velocity would always keep moving in the positive x direction right it will keep always increasing so this option and this option get eliminated immediately because the there's the velocity here it says that the velocity increases and dec- decreases this also says it increases and decreases no it would only increase so it is either this or this so we have eliminated two options all right now which is this uh is it this one or that one so the only difference which i see in in this graph and that graph is the peak value the peak value here it says is f not by mb and here it says f not b by m which one is it now it's very curious that the way they have arranged these three variables f not m and b uh, are different in these two cases okay which means that either one of them would have the dimensions of velocity the exact dimensions of velocity see, from here i can figure out from here e to the power of minus bt you know whatever is in the power of e should be dimensionless it means that b should have the dimensions of 1 by t or the unit should be 1 per second or you know basically you can see the dimension is 1 by t right so b has has a dimension of 1 by t so 1 by b has a dimension of t so this is basically uh, the dimensions of force by dimensions of mass which is basically dimensions of acceleration times 1 by b which is which has dimensions of time 
So this has dimensions of velocity, which automatically makes that tells us that this doesn't have dimensions of velocity. So option B is the right option. All you have to do is uh, so we didn't get into actually finding how the curve looks like. We just eliminated and found out that you know only this makes sense to be the right option here. Now in this problem we are given a highly rigid cubical box A of small mass m and side L which is fixed rigidly onto another cubical box B of the same dimensions and of a lower modulus of rigidity eta such that the lower face of A completely covers the upper face of B. The lower face of B is rigidly held on a horizontal surface. A small force F is then applied perpendicular to one of the sides, side faces of A. After the force is withdrawn, uh, block A executes a small oscillation. Cool. The time period of the oscillation is. So basically, this is a, this is a problem where I have to find the force and then I have to see if the force is proportional to the displacement and uh, I know that A is equal to omega square x or so so the moment you read this problem you can actually start actually solving this problem okay it sounds like a little little complex problem but you can start solving that problem right or which the the wiser thing to do is to go to the options when you look at the options you see 2 pi root over m eta l 2 pi root over m eta by l so what you see is the variables in the options are all jumbled okay the so in one of the options l is in the denominator in other it's in the numerator in one eta is in the denominator in some it's in the numerator it means that all the four options have different dimensions which means that only one of the options would match the dimension of the quantity which you would want to find which is time okay so i don't actually have to solve this problem all i have to do is match the dimensions okay if if i was wise enough to look at the options before actually having to solve the problem so so let's do that so mass has dimensions of kilogram it's actually m with that square bracket but when nobody's looking i just write kilogram because it doesn't do any harm eta is what eta is stress by strain stress is force per unit area so it is force which is kilogram meter per second square by area is meter square and strain has no dimensions so this is basically this is basically kilogram per meter per second square that's eta and l will be like just meters so which one would fit so let's do this this is mass uh, so this is kilograms times this right times this okay nothing gets cancelled so this can't be this because i want basically so in, in the inside the under root i want second square to come right because only then the dimension will be of seconds which i want so let's check this uh, mass is kilogram uh, so kilograms times of eta is kilogram per meters per meter times of uh, per, per second square divided by L. No, the kilogram won't cancel. This won't be the right one. Uh, let's check the next one. Here you have uh, mass, which is kilogram times of L, which is meter divided by eta, which is kilogram, okay, per meter per second square. All right, here the meter doesn't get canceled. This gets canceled. Those, this can't be the right option. So which brings me to the fourth option. I hope is the right answer which is kilogram you have mass in the numerator divided by eta which is kilogram meter per meter per second square from here and then you have an L which is uh, just meter so and the root of that so you have got kilogram kilogram cancel this cancel so you have got under root of second square the second so only the fourth option matches with the dimensions of time so that's the right answer In this problem, you are given a uniformly charged thin spherical shell of radius r which carries uniform charge density of sigma per unit area. It is made of two hemispherical shells held together by pressing them with a force F. Now we have to find out what this force F is proportional to. Now when you actually try to solve this problem, it's not a very easy problem to solve. But when you have a look at the options, you find that the variables are jumbled up. It means that among all these options, you see uh, none of the options have the variables in the, in the same order. Okay, it means that all of them have different dimensions. 
So we just have to figure out which is has the dimensions of force. So how do I do this? So uh, I can actually find the dimensions of absolute naught and then sigma and then r and then fit into all these four options and check. Or I can use some quantities, the dimensions of which I already know. I know that sigma is charged by area. So sigma times the dimensions of area, which is sigma times r square, will give you the dimensions of charge. Right? This is just a pure dimensional equation which I've written. So sigma times r square gives you charge, and I know force basically uh, dimensionally is equal to charge times charge is q1 q2 is charge square divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. So let's forget about that 4 pi epsilon naught times r square, right? Dimensionally, this is what these are the arrangement of the quantities that we have in force. Now, q I can write as sigma r square from here. I have a square of that, so it is it's q square divided by epsilon naught times of r square. So that gives me sigma square r to the power of 4 divided by epsilon naught r square and this gets cancelled so you get sigma square r square by epsilon naught. That is your option number A and that's the right option. So in this problem you are given a solid conducting sphere that has a charge Q. And it is surrounded by an uncharged conducting hollow spherical shell. All right. So let the potential difference between the surface of the solid sphere and that of the outer surface of the hollow shell be V. So that means that the potential difference between this guy and this guy is V. Now the problem says that if the shell is now given a charge of minus Q. Okay. So you give it a charge of minus minus four Q. The new potential difference between the two surfaces will be what? Okay. That's what we have to find out. Now, this is a problem which is actually really, really simple. Okay, so you can you can you can have two approaches. You can actually solve for uh, the potential differences by by using the actual definition of how a charge is being brought from infinity to that point and all that. Or you can use this fact that when you have a charge Q right on a sphere here, the electric field to it will be radially outside like that, right? And if let's say that electric field is E and this distance is D then the potential difference will just be e times d right that's very simple now what happens when i give this guy on the top a charge q now when you have a sphere and you give a charge to it the charge comes to the surface but the electric field to that charge doesn't come inside the sphere right inside the sphere the electric field is zero so no matter whether i give it a charge q or 2q or 5q or 100q or 1000q or a million q the electric field inside will be zero because of this new charge addition. So electric field inside will still be because of the inner charge, which is still Q and the electric field will be E. So the potential difference between both these surfaces will be just again E times D, which is V. So the right option is V. So you see that in this problem, we could solve this problem by this very simple logic and actually not using any integration. Now in this problem, you're given a parallel plate capacitor and you're told that it has a side A separated by a distance of D. The lower triangular portion is filled with a dielectric of dielectric constant K as shown in the figure. The capacitance of this capacitor is now you can actually solve this problem by taking small elements and then, you know, integrating it all over by, you know, by finding out that there are series combinations and then parallel combinations and all that thing. And it'll take you at least five to seven minutes to solve this problem, no matter how fast you're doing it, because the calculations are also uh, not not very straight. Like it's, it's a lot of it's a kind of mess. But if you look at the options, right, uh, when you look at the options, you can solve this problem basically in 20 seconds. How would you do that now? It's given that this the this dielectric uh, is being placed. Now, in case this dielectric was not there, in, in case you can say that the value of k was equal to one, that is like that's equal to saying there was no dielectric or dielectric of dielectric constant one, then this whatever the result we are getting should reduce to epsilon naught a by d, which is absolute a square by d in this case because the area is a square, right? So. Let's look at the first one. If you put k is equal to one, you don't get epsilon naught a square by d. You don't get that, right? So a cannot be the right answer. When you look at uh, b, 
k epsilon a so if you put k is equal to 1 you get epsilon a square d times 0 so you get 0 that's that's also not correct when you look at c you get okay in the denominator you get 0 in the numerator you get 0 so you basically get a 0 by 0 form and if, when you put it, it in d you get uh, epsilon naught a square by 4d square 4d right so that's also not true because for k is equal to 1 you should get epsilon naught a by d or a square by d right so only option c which is an indeterminate form and by the way indeterminate form means if some something is an indeterminate form it doesn't mean it's zero it means that it can take any value which is which we are not sure right depending on the value of k it can take any value so it's definitely not a not b and not d so it has to be the option number c Now in this problem you are given a spring of stiffness k and it is cut into two parts a and b and the lengths are in the ratio 2 is to 3 then the stiffness of spring a is given by how much so we have to find the stiffness of spring a and you can do it or you can use a little of logic so what you can say is let's say the uh, spring constant of a is k1 and that of b is k2 okay and their combination is k right their resultant uh, uh, spring constant is k so you know that when springs are in series the way they add up is in the inverse ratio and what it results to if you, you should know this result that the resultant it will be something which is lesser than k1 as well as it is something which is lesser than k2 okay it is smaller than all the individuals now what does that mean it means that k1 is greater than k and k2 is greater than k when i look at these this options right you see that the first option is less than k the second option is also less than k the third option is equal to k none of them is possible only the fourth option is possible because that is greater than k and so option d is the right option Now in this problem we are given a, a inductor coil of 20 henry and a resistance of 10 ohms and they are connected in series uh, with an emf source and we are told that uh, we have to find the time at which the rate of dissipation of energy in the resistance is equal to the rate at which the magnetic energy b is being stored at the inductor now the usual way to solve this problem which we have, we have also done is uh, is by doing both so the energy dissipated across the resistor is i square r okay and the energy stored at the inductor is just v times i where v is l times di by dt so it will be l times di by dt times i right and we, all you have to do is equate these two things knowing that the way current uh, changes in an, in an rl circuit is i is equal to i naught 1 minus e to the power of minus t by tau so this is how the current increases right so all you'll do now is equate these two guys you'll get l di by dt is equal to i r and then you'll put the values of i and you'll differentiate it and you'll then you'll uh, just basically your i naught is e by r and then you'll finally have to integrate again and find that answer like you know at what part particular time t that this happened that uh, this thing becomes equal the powers become equal but there's an alternate and easier way to solve this okay i know that across the resistor the the power dissipated will be just v times i i can say the same thing about the inductor so say vr times i is equal to vl times i okay so when i equate it in that form i can very clearly see that vr must be equal to vl right for the powers to be same that means the time at which the power dissipated by the resistance is exactly equal to that of the stored by the inductor right when the potential difference across them is same now the total potential difference in this circuit is going to be equal to e right because e is the emf source so vl uh, vr becoming equal to vl that means that both of them must be equal to e by 2 right now what is vl uh, in, as a function of time we know that in an, in an rc circuit or an rl circuit the way current increases or decreases is always a function of e to the power of minus t by tau but that is also true with the potential difference across the inductor or capacitor. They are always a function of e to the power of minus t by tau. All you have to figure out is whether it is increasing or decreasing. right? In this case the current was increasing because initially the current was zero and then it will slowly increase. Okay. 
But what about potential? Initially, the current was zero, so it means that there was no current through this, so the potential difference across the inductor was just E. But with time, what will happen? This you can say that the resistor will take up some portion of that potential difference and it will be deprived of the potential difference. Okay, and after a very, very long time, when the steady current is is flowing then the potential difference across the inductor will become zero so the potential difference across the inductor that is vl is actually decreasing okay so i can say vl is equal to its maximum value which is e times e to the power of minus t by tau it will always be a function of that i know that okay so this is a mnemonic to remember now if you remember this mnemonic then i can just simply equate this to like what e by 2 right so i basically want e minus t by tau to be equal to 1 by 2 now that means if I take the log of this to the base E on both ends, I get minus T by tau equal to uh, minus ln 2 or T equals to tau times of ln 2. So at the time T is equal to ln 2 times tau, the power dissipated at the resistor would precisely be equal to the energy, the rate at which the energy is being stored at the inductor. Here the value of tau is uh, tau is equal to L by R. Okay. And what will that be equal to? The value of L is given as 20 and R is given as 10. So the value of tau is 2. So the answer here will be 2 times of ln 2. In this question, we are given a metallic rod of length L, which is tied to a string of length 2L and is made to rotate with an angular speed on a horizontal table with one of the strings fixed. Now, if there is a vertical magnetic field in the region, the EMF induced across the ends of the rod is. Okay, so now, you know, there's a usual way of solving this problem, which is by using integration. When you look at the options, you see that option A and B have like sim similar arrangement of terms, but that is different from the option C and D. Okay, so you can clearly see that there must be some kind of dimensional uh, analysis that can be done here. I know that the 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 EMF generated across a moving rod is this B V L. Okay, and instead of V, when we have omega, omega can be so dimensionally I'm just talking about. So we can give, it can be written B times of omega L times L. So it is B omega L square. That should be the dimensions of the EMF. Okay, so. It can't be A and can't be B because it's B omega L cube. So A and B is just all eliminated. All you have left is C or D. But when I look at option C, right? So it's 4B omega L square by 2. That's just a fancy way of writing it. You know, 2 times of B omega uh, L square, right? Now, what does that mean? This means that I can write this as B times of 2 omega L times of L, okay? Now, what does this mean? This this is like B times V times L, okay? This entire thing has dimensions of V. It's basically, if we, we can say that if the entire rod was moving with a speed which is equal to this, right? Then this would be the EMF across its ends, right? B times of, if this were V and this was L. But when you look at our rod, this edge, right? This edge has the speed of two times of omega times of L. And as you move across towards the other end, the speed, increases because you know right speed omega times r as r increases speed increases it means that the emf across this rod should definitely be more than this because it increases with speed right so it can't be three it has to be it can't be option c it has to be option number d So in this problem it is said that it is found that a neutron suffers an elastic collinear collision with a deuterium at rest and that there is a fractional loss of its energy which is we are calling PD while for its similar collision with a carbon nucleus which is also at rest the fractional loss of energy is PC. Now we have to find the values of PD and PC okay, respectively so we are given four options here. Now you can solve this problem by by using the conservation of momentum and then finding the loss in kinetic energy for both the cases and then find actually figuring out what are these values. But when I look at the options, I see that in all the options, there's only one option in which, uh, you know, the the one with the, the, the fractional loss in deuterium is more than that of carbon. And otherwise, it's all the other way around. Okay, so can I use some kind of logic here? I know that 
when when something comes and collides with something else right when one object collides with something else the heavier this thing is let's say this was infinitely heavy then what will happen is it will just come collide and just go back with the same speed it will not lose energy at all it will retain all its energy so the heavier something is to which it collides the lesser is the loss in energy okay so lighter something is more is the loss in energy so loss in energy will be more in case of deuterium than in case of carbon okay and so option 1 can't be possible is not possible because it just says zero option 2 is not possible again because it says that the one in carbon is more option 3 says that in deuterium the fractional loss is more than that in carbon makes sense option 3 can be right option 4 or option d says that the other way around okay so you know that option c is the only right option you don't have to actually solve this problem for more videos and live lectures on the jee click on the subscribe button now